Okay, and welcome back to the second video in the Space Shooter tutorial series. In this video, I just wanted to run through setting up the variables and some of the driving components that will help us manage the player blueprint. So that's going to be the first thing we create. If we right click inside of the blueprints folder, we'll create a new class and we want this to be of type pawn. So when it comes to blueprint classes, there isn't particularly a right or wrong approach, but um, we can see the generic functionalities of what each blueprint class is made to do just by these descriptions just here so that we can see that an actor is something, an object which is placed or spawned in the world. So this is going to be things such as pickups or um, destructible objects, general things that the player will interact with, uh, doors and things like that as well. Uh, we then have pawn, uh, which is something that could be possessed and receive input from a controller. Uh, and by controller, in this terminology, it doesn't mean like a, a game controller. Uh, it means more like a, an AI controller, so it doesn't have to be human possessed. We then have other things like the character. So the character is different in that it is a pawn that includes the ability to walk around. So we can already see just by reading that that we know that we probably don't want a spaceship with the ability to walk around. So what we're going to take is a pawn class. Um, and if you're new to this, then there's an abundance of information on the Epic documentation. Uh, there's a lot of different blueprint classes and you start to get the feel of which ones are right for which situation as you use them really. Uh, but that's going to be a really good place to check out. So using the same naming convention, we'll call this BP underscore player. And if we just hit enter, that will load up the, uh, the player blueprint. And now another thing I like to do is we're going to go back to the main window. We'll click on edit and we'll go to editor preferences. And what this will allow us to do is we can go down here and we can find the asset editor open location. This is what controls where, when you double click something, where it opens. And you can see it made a new window like it did here. Uh, what I want this to do is to make it on the main window. So if we drop that down and select main window, that means if we double click anything now, it will always load up here. So it just saves us dragging it to the top of the window. Small time saving tip there. Okay, so if we start to flesh out the player ship, what we want first of all is we'll add a new component and the first thing we need is a static mesh. So this is just going to be the visual representation of the ship. And we can drag that onto the default scene route. And I'll just call this the player mesh. A few shortcut tips here. You can either do a slow double click to change the name or you can use F2 to rename anything in the Unreal Engine is F2. And we'll move on over to the static mesh. And for now, we'll just give it the SM pixel player. So that's the one that we had ready from our migrated content. And just in preparation, uh, we'll add a few other things whilst we're here. I'm going to get a scene component. So if I type scene component, we'll get the scene component and we'll call this one the projectile spawn. So this is simply going to be where the projectiles are being spawned later when we start adding the firing functionality. Um, and in fact, whilst that's selected, we can just drag that up somewhere around about there on his nose seems fine. And finally, uh, we will have a particle system at some point. So if we just add a component and call this particle system. Um, and the final thing we can see is this started as a child of the projectile spawn point. So if we just click that and drag it back onto the projectile spawn point, uh, that oddly enough makes it not a child anymore. It dechilds it. So just do that because we don't want it to take or inherit the uh, the position or anything from the projectile spawn point. And then we can just drag the particle system down. It's going to be coming out somewhere around about down here. Okay, and the next things we need to add are going to be the variables. So if we go to the variables and the first thing I want is to find out, we're going to set later on whether or not the player ship can move because we're going to add a fancy little spawning animation and we don't want the player to have control of the ship whilst the ship is spawning. So we're just going to say move enabled. We'll call that move enabled and hit enter. And we'll just make sure that by default, if we hit compile, that will load this variable and make sure this is unticked so it starts off as false. So now we're going to add all of the float variables that will be inside of the player blueprint. So if we add a new variable, and the first one I'm just going to call Yule. And this is just my preference when I'm starting a project, uh, especially if I have a good idea of what the blueprint's going to do. I try to create all of the variables ahead of time. And obviously, we you can't always do that. And there will be a lot of going back and forwards to add variables as and when you need them. Uh, but because I know that I need these for a fact, I'm just going to add them in now, which means that when we need to start adding them into the blueprint logic, 
uh, they are there ready for us to play about with. So don't worry if these don't make sense or you don't know what they are at the moment. Uh, all of that will be explained as we go through. Uh, but the, the other good reason that if you do know what variables you're going to need or you can guess at the variables that you're going to need, uh, this is the next thing I was going to say, is that if we can create a set of variables at the same time, of the same type, it means that we don't need to keep changing the type value over here. So the next variable that we create now is going to be a float because the last one was. So we can create all of our floats now, that's going to save us time. So the next one I want is a float called delta seconds. The next float will be called hos speed. So for horizontal speed, just shortened. Uh, next one will be vert speed. Oh, just press something there. So later on that will be controlling the horizontal and the vertical speed separately. And both of those will combine to make the movement speed. And we also want to keep track of the current speed that the player will be moving. And the last two, uh, we want one called health, so this will be the active health in the game. And then we want one called max health, so this will be the total amount of health the player can have at any one time. And we're going to make this public by just ticking the eye thing here so that we can edit this wherever. And we can also access that in other places if needed. And now two more variables. Uh, this one's going to be called spawn location. We're going to go over here to the variable type and we'll change this to a vector. And then finally, uh, later on, we're going to need a reference to the game mode that we created earlier. So we're going to start passing things between different blueprints. And to do that, we need a reference of it. So knowing that ahead of time, we're going to create a variable ready for that. And we're going to call this BP underscore game mode, because that's exactly what we'll be storing later. So if we drop down this, uh, this one's going to be something we need to search for. So if we type BP underscore game mode, and we can see that's our game mode that we made earlier. And we want a reference, so the blue colored node here. Uh, which will be a reference to that game mode. Okay, so that is the variable set up for the player. So we might as well set up the input settings so that they're ready to go when we need to start accessing them. So if we go to the input option down here, uh, we can set up the action mappings. So if we begin by creating a new action mapping called primary fire. So the action mappings are simply single press functions um, such as jumping or firing. Uh, something you can tap on and it either has an off or on reaction and the buttons that i want to control the primary fire are going to be the left mouse button and if you wanted you can press the plus sign again and you can assign other buttons to the primary fire so you can have like space be primary fire and the mouse button be primary fire that's completely up to you um, i'm just going to keep it to one button for this we'll create a whole new action mapping now and we'll call this secondary fire and we'll just access the right mouse button. Okay, so they're going to be the two action mappings that we need for the project. And the next thing we want will be our axis mappings. So for the axis mappings, this will be things that take value over time, so it's something you can hold down. Uh, it would be the different points on the analog stick if you're using analog sticks. And we'll be using a, a value range between minus one and one. So minus one will be going backwards, or if you had an analog stick, it'd be pulling downwards and one will be pushing forwards. But we can use key presses as well. So we're going to call this one move up because we'll be moving up the screen. And it just skipped me off of there, sorry. And to control this, um, I will use up and we'll add another one. We will call the second one down. So these are the actual keys on the keyboard. And we also, I'm going to add different options in here. So as well as allowing the user to use up and down, I'm going to use W and S, A and D as well. And finally, we'll get S. And this is the scale value I mentioned. So up and W will be a value of one because they're going up the screen, positive. And down and S will be minus one because they're going down the screen, negative. And then similar to that, we'll create a second axis mapping. And we'll just call this move right. And you'll notice we're not creating up, down, left, and right. We're just moving up and right. And we're assigning the up and the down to a single axis mapping and left and right to a single axis mapping as well. So we'll get the left button and the right button. So these are the left and right arrows. And then we'll get the A key and the D key. And again, we'll just change these to have a done this the opposite way around this time. So we'll get minus one for the left and minus one for A. And uh, 
1 and 1 for right and D. And then again, if we just go back and control shift S to save everything, uh, that is everything now ready for when we start implementing logic into the player blueprint. I'll be trying to keep these videos fairly short and uh, kind of make them specific to functions or topics within what we'll be creating, just for easy reference if you needed to go back and check something. So I'll leave that one here for today. As always though, if you've enjoyed the content or find it useful, then please do leave a like and give the video a share, that always helps. If you'd like to be kept up to date with the latest content, then do feel free to subscribe to the channel. Alternatively, you can follow me on Twitter. Links for that will be in the description below. And now, if you'd like to show your support for the channel, you can check out the Patreon page. As ever, though, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.